I get questions all the time like, hey, what's the best luxury watch, first luxury watch that you can purchase? And that is a ridiculously loaded question. I have no idea how ever to answer it because it really is just going to come down to the person, their lifestyle, and what is going to be the best for their type of scenario. But what I wanted to do is kind of look at a list of entry level luxury watches or luxury watches that are kind of that do it all, really kind of just, I would say standardized, mass appealing type of luxury watch that would be a safe choice for many people out there. We're gonna make this a list here and kind of how this is gonna be is these have to be versatile watches in terms of their wear and having it be on the wrist. Also, it kind of has to be in that range so it could be like that first luxury watch. So say like three and a half thousand dollars in kind of getting into the range of like six thousand dollars, maybe seven at the most, because I think that is kind of in the Goldilocks zone of where a lot of people might have a budget for an actual luxury watch. And then finally, one other point of consideration for me when developing this list is thinking about brand equity a bit more here, because when you're talking about a first luxury watch, having some popularity, some demand around the watch that maybe uh, as you're kind of developing your taste, you can move on from, I think that is very valuable. So before we jump in, I typically don't do these very often, but wristwatch check, I'm wearing a Hamilton Intramatic, this champagne dial, kind of almost like a salmon dial. It's very attractive. I think one of the better looking Hamilton watches I've seen from them in the past 12 months. I really like this one. We'll have a link in the description for more details on teddyballiser.com, so definitely check it out. Now for our first watch on the list here today, I think this really has become the epitome of the kind of style of watch that we kind of described as being that great gateway into the world of luxury watches, and that is the Tudor Black Bay. When this thing was released less than a decade ago, it really did allow Tudor to kind of just reemerge in the marketplace, and they've kind of been following that momentum ever since. In terms of the particular model that we can look at, I think the Tudor Black Bay 58 is probably now becoming their most popular model. It improves on many of the faults of the design or maybe some of the uh, points of criticism people have with the design, updating the case size to be a bit smaller at 39 millimeters, 47 millimeter lug to lug, and you're also getting a refined movement with the MT5402 inside. There's just a lot to like from the Tudor Black Bay 58 family, now getting a good amount of options here as well. You have the new silver versions, which uh, of course with its case material being a bit more eclectic there, you also have the navy dial as well as the classic gilt version that was really that OG. But the Black Bay 58, in terms of what it's representing, it's, it falls in a very competitive price range being south of $4,000 that if you are wanting a casual do-it-all piece with a great brand, this is a fantastic watch to go for. Now for this next one, I was contemplating what watch from this brand to actually feature here but I decided to go with the Breitling Super Ocean Heritage rather than the Navitimer because the Navitimer, if you're starting to get into uh, their in-house calibers, it starts getting up there in price and I think it's a bit more of an aspirational piece compared to this one, which is going to be the Super Ocean Heritage 2. So you probably could pick any Super Ocean here. I think these are fantastic watches. Honestly, pretty underrated from a mainstream brand, but these are fabulous watches for what they're providing. So the Super Ocean Heritage though, and why I decided to choose this one, was because it does house the Breitling B20, which is a Tudor-based movement. So you're getting a 70-hour power reserve in here, classic kind of vintage diver style, with a price range that isn't too bad for a Breitling at around $5,000, and you typically can find these pre-owned for some really competitive rates and wearable case at the 42 millimeter option. Another honorable mention within the Super Ocean family is the 57, which has those kind of retro indices and is gonna be, of course, classic to the original Super Ocean design and is very wearable on the wrist. I tried a couple of these on and I was incredibly impressed with the wearability. You are getting a different movement inside of there, so you're getting just basically a top grade at a movement in there that's gonna be modified, but still a fantastic watch and Breitling as a brand, I think has been doing a really good job as of late. Uh, they had a great showing at Watches and Wonders and the Super Ocean has always kind of been a favorite of mine for quite some time. Now when it comes to one of the biggest no-brainers in luxury watches in terms of value, that is with the Omega Seamaster Diver 300. Now for around $5,000, $4,900 on a strap and then $5,200 on the bracelet, 
This watch falls in a range that is really tough to beat. You're getting an Omega coaxial 8800 caliber inside, master chronometer, solid power reserve, 300 meters of water resistance, 42 millimeter case is a little bit larger on the wrist. Lug to lug isn't too bad. You do have that helium escape valve, which pretty much is my only single gripe with this watch. But in terms of the dial finishing, this thing is so sharp, ceramic bezel, variety of different color options to go for. They just released a new version to kind of pay tribute to the Tokyo Olympics, which goodness, the color combinations on this thing with the blue bezel, white dial, that is a killer combo. I hope we can see that in a main production model as it continues to go. But still, even with that 42 millimeter case, it is pretty wearable, all things considered. I see a lot of people wearing these things and putting these on the wrist. It just is a substantial watch, a really well-made watch, and also an iconic watch, a term that gets thrown around a lot. But if there's one watch that is probably worthy of it, this is certainly one. But what I think makes the Seamaster Diver 300 so compelling is just where it falls. $5,000, you have the Tudor Black Bay beneath it, which I think when you put these things side to side, the Omega does definitely stand out and has a bit more just presence to it, of course, and the finishing coaxial movement inside. But then you look what's above it, and I think that's where it gets even more impressive. When you see the separation in price compared to some of the other luxury dive watches out there, this one is a very compelling package. Now for the next watches we're gonna mention here, I'm gonna be looking at some IWC Pilot watches, and I'm gonna basically throw two in here. I know that's kind of cheating, but one being the Mark 18 and the other being the Spitfire. So both of these watches are going to have that Pilot watch design in terms of what they're going for, which IWC is one of the brands that has certainly made this look just famous. High legibility, high contrast, and what they're going for, a variety of different options to go for when you're talking about the Mark 18 family. Some nice on the fly adjustment with the clasp, as well as some adjustable links within the bracelet. It does have a top grade at a movement inside the Mark 18, but if you go over to the Spitfire, that is going to be using a manufacturer caliber, caliber produced by Richemont's uh, movement manufacturing arm, kind of leaning more into the classic kind of faux markers, which uh, is going to be polarizing for some, but you have two options to choose here. Both IWC and their history of pilot watches, there's certainly a lot to like here. And next up, we have a new watch from the Tudor Black Bay Chrono family that was just unveiled at Watches and Wonders with the new Tudor Black Bay Chrono, the 79360. Now these two versions that were unveiled, I think really kind of did steal the show on the first day, especially from Rolex. Uh, these of the Rolex Tudor family really stood out immediately. They slimmed down the case in a very creative way with how they were able to reposition the dial within the case. That really does help in terms of this one on the wrist. The only problem with the original Black Bay Chronos, it was never the design of those. It really was the thickness and to see that there were improvements here is a big step in the right direction. But I think the main reason why this watch, apart from the overall looks of it, which it is very attractive, is going to be the movement inside of here. So we have a modified B01, which if you're talking about price ranges here, you're looking at 49 to uh, $5,200 in terms of this watch. And then you look at some Breitling watches with the B01 inside of there, you're gonna be talking of thousands of dollars in terms of a difference here. So you're talking about a manufacturer caliber, nice power reserve, column wheel chronograph movement at this price. Very competitive. I don't wanna say it's necessarily the best in this range, but certainly a knockout for Tudor. And I think a watch that wasn't maybe considered as a almost no brainer, if you are going for a watch of this style, now quickly becoming a no brainer. Now, speaking of no brainer, let's look at the Omega Aquaterra. And I recently did a video talking about the Aquaterra and how it could possibly be the best do it all luxury watch in 2021. And I basically made that claim for a few reasons. One, in terms of the design perspective, this watch can kind of just do it all. It has a little bit of the Seamaster flash, so it has some polished elements as well as some brushed elements, but it kind of fuses those things together, has some almost like Railmaster of the 21st century type of approach, both in its specification with its master chronometer being resistant up to uh, 15,000 Gauss in uh, magnetic fields, and then also in regards to its nice power reserve of 60 hours, getting an 8,900 caliber in size, and a price range of around $5,000 with a variety of different colors and also case options to choose from. But the reason why I think the Omega Aquaterra is so compelling is just kind of the macroeconomics of the industry. No games with this piece, a ton of versions to choose from, 
on the specification side, absolutely some of the best in class for the price and also being able to just kind of be worn in a variety of different situations. That creates a winning formula for a watch. And not to mention, we're talking about Omega here and from a brand equity standpoint, it's going to be the one of the strongest that you're gonna find out there on the market. So now for this next one, I was almost a little bit hesitant to present this model. And I don't think I could have presented it maybe three years ago as being kind of like a no brainer luxury watch, but I think it has quickly emerged as kind of uh, one of the most popular watches in this price range, no questions asked for the type of people that watch this channel uh, who are enthusiasts, and that is with the Grand Seiko Snowflake, the SBGA 211. Now, the type of person that's gonna go for a Grand Seiko is a very different person than probably who's gonna go for the rest of the watches on this list. Now, what the Grand Seiko does well, I think we know what that is. It really is the dial case finishing and kind of that artisanal Japanese meticulous approach in terms of their manufacturing. And that all is really well embodied with the actual movement inside of here, talking about the 9R65 spring drive movement. And with that spring drive basically combines two elements together, that endless power supply of mechanical energy from a traditional mainspring that will wind with a rotor. And then also on the flip side, the accuracy of quartz oscillation uh, using a totally different technology with the tri-synchro regulator. I have an entire video talking about this and uh, just kind of giving some um, backstory around the spring drive and how it actually works. So I will just link to it down below if you want some more information on that. But all of this in terms of what it's going for, this was the watch that kind of paved the way and I think it's allowed Grand Seiko to be the brand that it is today in the market as being, I think now from an enthusiast perspective, a brand that many people love. Now I've already mentioned two Omega watches on this list. So to mention a third, I think that only goes to show how just competitive they are in this price range of talking about say a first luxury watch. And next we're gonna have to look at the Omega Speedmaster. We're gonna look at the latest generation of the newest moon watch. And of course you could look at a variety of different Speedmaster options in terms of what is the best one to go for. In terms of classic appeal, I think the moon watch makes the most sense. For the new moon watch, there's a few major updates, of course, with that one, with the 3861 caliber, as well as the new bracelet, which I'm a huge fan of, and I think is a great improvement on the previous version. But the Omega Speedmaster, why it is so great, is it combines all of these elements together that is just historical significance, classic design, as well as luxury spec, all into one and also having kind of this approachable nature and kind of ubiquitous nature about it that I think so many people have come to love and appreciate. You could go for the Hesalite or the Sapphire version. I think the Hesalite, if you wanna go for a classic version, probably is the one to go for. And I do have a full review on that watch coming up very soon and might be out even before this one. So definitely check it out. And now for our last watch on the list, I wanted to just pick out one Rolex watch, and that is with the Rolex Explorer, the 124270, the latest model, but I also will have a ton of footage of the 214270, as both of them, I think, are fantastic versions, with one being discontinued. So just to speak about the Rolex Explorer and why I think it is so compelling. You also could look at the Oyster Perpetual in this range, but I think the history that comes with the Explorer is iconic, but never doing too much design, it kind of almost epitomizes Rolex. And in regards to the Explorer, it kind of is the sports watch in which all other sports watches in a way have been built from Rolex. Maybe at least the Submariner is an example and some other models. This remains one of the only watches that Rolex makes that doesn't kind of lean into flash as much. It really, I mean, we, we did see the two-tone version, but I'm not talking about that one. Classic stainless steel that really does just kind of embody the classic ethos of Rolex still, which is a hard thing to identify in modern day Rolex. But simply put, this watch is complete from top to bottom. It can simply do everything for you. Keep it on the bracelet and it is a do-it-all sports watch. We'll have you covered in every scenario. And then maybe put it on a strap and this watch could certainly be worn in dressing or environments with a suit with the right attire. There are very few watches that can check off the boxes in many ways. I perhaps might be thinking a little bit too optimistically in having it in this video given that these are a bit hard to get as well as every Rolex and that's why I didn't want this video to be all Rolex watches but if you can get it at a good price of course or retail price it is an absolute no-brainer as well as the Oyster Perpetual as that one and done or maybe that one and only watch that you can have for the rest of your life. All right, guys, well, thank you again so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. That really does help out the channel. And also leave a comment down below. If you had to pick out like say three luxury watches that are most mass appealing, could be great, just do it all, first luxury watches, 
which three watches would you choose? Love to see comments down below and do you agree with this list that we kind of put together here? Kind of had to draw the line somewhere in regards to which one you're gonna choose and they might not be the most unique things out there, but if you're kind of just refining that taste, figuring things out, you want your first luxury watch, I think a lot of these are probably some of the best ones and then you can probably go for, at least in my opinion. Also, if you wanna stay up to date with other types of content that we're doing, Definitely follow on Instagram as well. See some great photos of watches. Also doing exclusive giveaways and things of that sort. So definitely follow over there too. And also teddybaldasar.com, full authorized dealer of all the brands that we carry, over 25 brands. Quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support. Also a full warranty for every single product that we carry. And nine out of every $10 that we generate goes right back into this content that we're creating. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I'll see you all very soon.